the the more we become conscious of the existence of the etheric body the more we come to know of the laws of nature working upon our constitution we will understand the strange phenomena which we call the appetite the thirst etc understand the real meaning and significance of these phenomena and make a better use of those phenomena and generally speaking thoughts are conditioned by the etheric matter in our body but when some part of our etheric body is damaged thoughts automatically travel in a damaged way in our mind so to say when there is a spot of vulnerability in the etheric matter there is a weak point and a vulnerable spot in our thinking also and though we know that something is wrong we accept to do it so the rupture in any part of the etheric body not only conditions our thought currents but also it chucks out a deformity in our habits and behavior and as a result it produces abnormal growths of tissues on the physical spot corresponding to the area see how sometimes when we have some growth of muscle uh, a muscular growth or some tissue we get it operated but once again we get it if there is a polyp in the nose or ear many okay. times when it is cauterized once again it is got when there is a lump when it is cut or surgically operated once again it occurs at the same place and an obstinate ulcer which gets refused to heal on the physical plane when it is medically healed it appears again at the same spot after some years and a yes, skin disease like eczema after it is totally cured on the physical plane it appears exactly at the same place again and again because the disease spot exists on the etheric body not on the physical body what's the use of our washing the physical cells with medicines when the water is polluted with ink and made into an ice block what is the use of washing the ice block with water similarly any any impurity or a pollution that is there on the etheric plane can never be cured by physical means so yogic methods and good food and exposure to sun and fresh air and water are the only remedies even these methods are only temporary unless the thought becomes progressive the more and more we begin to grow positive about the welfare of others the more and more automatically the etheric body is made pure and as you know the statistics in the world now if you if you observe people the healthiest and the strongest of people are found among those who think of others health and others welfare and who do who have no time to think about their health you will find a resistance of a very rare and high order in their constitution they will be radiating life and light face beaming like chitta so this is the main clue for everything and the more we try to rectify the faults of the etheric body 
the more the thoughts are regulated and rectified. But at the same time, the more the thought is regulated, the sooner the etheric body is cured of its defects. There is a peculiar vicious circle which is to be known in the end. See how the universal consciousness produces etheric matter and the etheric matter produces physical matter. Physical matter produces our own body and the physical cells of our brain form a seed of our mind. See how the material plane becomes the seed of our existence. And appointing the mind to protect the physical vehicle. See, our mind is made manifest by the physical cells. Without the physical and etheric cells, there is no manifestation of an individual mind. That manifest mind is appointed to take care of the physical cells. It is the circuit. Matter manifests mind and mind is expected to take care of matter. So, it is a riddle. We can't understand which is the beginning. It was said there was an insane fellow and the doctor advised that he should be married. Then he gets cured. And the father of the girl advised that he should be healed of his insanity. Then only I am ready to give my daughter. If you were to be married, he should be free from insanity. If we, he were to be liberated from his insanity, he should be married, medically speaking. That is the condition of every human being in this physical body. Every moment, mind is manifested through matter. Every moment, the mind is expected to frame rules and protect the matter. So there are only two people left in the jungle. The one has to protect the other. So in the on the etheric plane, whenever the etheric matter is ruptured, the thoughts are ruptured. We are expected to protect the etheric matter, to protect our thoughts. But the next step of your evolution is that in whichever direction you direct your thought, the fabric of the etheric matter begins to travel in that direction. If you produce a new dimension in your thought about some fine art, the bazaar, for example, are about some healthy occupation to the mind which was not there with you previously, you will produce a new center of interest or a nucleus. Just as you make a channel towards your own field of wheat from the river, then you will be able to tap the waters of the river into your field. The matter of the etheric body begins to take that direction. It forms a beautiful center of force. So, thoughts properly directed rectify the deformities of the etheric body and physical health is automatically established. This is the next stage of evolution which is called the yogic evolution. In the previous stage, our thoughts are controlled by the lines of force of the etheric matter. That is what we call the force of habit. In the next stage of evolution, you will understand the unfailing force of what you call habit. And you will direct 
the force of habit into the positive direction, required direction. And instead of fighting against your own emotions and faults and wasting your life and energy, you will be producing new channels of thought towards devotion and positive values. For example, if you are suffering from outbursts of anger, hitherto you were trying to get rid of your anger and fight out anger. The result is you are more conscious of your anger for more number of hours in the day. And you are meditating upon anger and the result is you are growing angry against your own anger. That is the fate of those who fight. And he equated these things with the astrological symbolism. The sun with the ayam, the moon with the mind, which he called water. Instead of mind, he used the word water. And he discussed it in mystic terms. He said, it is very easy to make water muddy. And he said, it is more difficult to make muddy water pure. Then he called the process distillation to extract pure water from muddy water, you have to use the process of distillation. That is the language he used. And he called, he equated mercury with our intellect. He equated Saturn with our habit forming nature and behavior. With these symbols, he compiled his work on alchemy and he left the other symbols not deciphered at all. But it may be a fact that he was teaching to his disciples directly and he never intended any book written at all. And it may be true that some of his students made some notes of his lessons. And it may be that those lessons came to be known as the writings of the Guru. Because there is no attempt for a book writing or a book making in the pages if we go through it. But at the same time, we find some windows opened into a new horizon of a new science. This is one aspect of the real alchemy and the others of real alchemy. One thing is certain that this gentleman knew certain dimensions of science which we do not know. He remembered himself through births and rivers and he continued his work through births. And afterwards, in one of his reincarnations, he was called Prince Rakhwasi, whom we call Comte Saint Germain, in his original sense. Because we have many fake Saint Germains. As many as five or six imitation Saint Germains in the modern age. And now at present, he is known as one of the masters of wisdom, who presides over the activity of the seventh ray, which we call the science of mysteries, or what we call 
the rituals in the real sense. The science of masonry in its purest sense. And the science is also called ceremonial magic. The imitation of which we find now in the temples of the various religions. But the original aspect of this science of rituals will be inaugurated once again in the temples. Sometime in the middle of the 21st century, along with the real secrets of alchemy, that is what the Tibetan also has promised in his works. Now about some more aspects of alchemy. We have in India a great master who is called, who was called Nagarjuna, whose original works still stand unpublished, many of them. He was a great, great master of the Buddhistic art. And he a scientist in a handful of different sciences who had trained disciples in each of the sciences under him. He has given us the science of purifying mercury with the help of herbs and plants. And the science of purifying gold with the help of mercury. And the science of using mercury upon human constitution and the utility of gold for medicinal and non-medicinal purificatory purposes for the human body. And above all, he has taught the existence and the possibility of mercury in solid form, in its pure state. And people laugh at it if we speak that mercury exists in solid state. But his alchemy seems to belong to both these schools, that is the symbolic and also the mineral. He not only believed in transmuting the lower metals into the higher, but also he had trained disciples to that effect. At the same time, he could conduct the symbolic alchemy over his disciples and leave to the world at least a handful of disciples with pure minds who cured themselves and cured others. He lived some, sometime about first century after Christ. And he lived in the western shores of South India and had his own institutions for students. It was a big university he conducted and students came from Ceylon, China, Burma and Japan. And about the branch of alchemy that belonged to Nagarjuna, we still have proofs that he had conducted the mineral alchemy to the success. I personally know three people, two of whom I can make you meet if you come to India, because the third one is no more now. And all the three have performed the mineral alchemy and we have a personal testimony of it. And one of them demanded some mercury 
and he got it purified with the help of some infusions of herbs and he conducted the whole experiment before us, ten of us and we got the pure gold prepared by him out of the mercury and he asked us to get it tested and we got it tested and he said that gold will be prepared by those who have no glamour for gold. He said that though everyone knows the chemical process of transmutation, he cannot do it at all unless he is above the glamour of gold. And not less than four times he prepared gold before our eyes. But not a single time he has given any piece of gold to any one of us. He suggested two alternatives. Okay. One is, if you want to use for medicinal purposes, I will administer the medicine to you, but not the gold. And some people had it administered and they had wonderful cures. And the second alternative he suggested was that he should sell it for an amount of money and the money should be used only to provide food for some people for no return. Preferably to the disabled, that is what he said. Those who are defective of hand and eye or ear or leg. These are the only two alternatives for which he used his gold. And another person who is this, of course, this first example <coughs> is still living in our round about our native place called Guntur district. There is there was another person who is no more now. He also belonged to the same district. Okay. And a very close friend of mine. He lived in Bombay always as a businessman. And he used to come to his native district once in a year and prepare such an amount of gold and sell it and use the amount to distribute the money to certain people who were disabled. And I had my own little experience with him which I will narrate you. There used to be coins in India which we called coppers. The coin was made of copper and he asked me to bring eight copper coins. I brought with seven copper coins 